and a coalition of sexual assault and human trafficking. We are recording today's session, um, so you can feel free to turn off your video for privacy if you prefer. Um, I also want to let folks know we will be talking about some pretty heavy topics today. So please, if you need to take a moment to step away, get yourself some water, practice some self-care, please do that. Um, some of the content we talk about today may be triggering for other survivors or folks in the audience. So please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, I believe everyone is already muted, but if you are not, please go ahead and mute your mic. Um, we want to make sure that whoever is speaking can be heard um, as they are giving their insight and sharing their wisdom with us. We do have CART services available today, so there are closed captioning services available if you click the button under closed captions at the bottom of your screen. Thank you to Deb Brown for being here today with us. Sierra will be in the chat for technical support. So if you're having any kind of tech issues or you have some questions, um, please feel free to pop in there and let her know. We are welcoming questions in today's panel discussion as well. Um, so please feel free to throw those in at any time and Sierra will um, bring those to our attention. We will be doing some Q&A at the end of our session today. All right, our panelists for today. I'm very pleased to welcome Luna everson Kloss. Luna is pictured on the left-hand side of our screen with brown hair and blonde highlights. She's smiling at the camera, wearing a brown t-shirt and using her mobility device. Luna is a mother and survivor of rape and domestic violence. Jody Powers is a uh, survivor advocate at Indiana Disability Justice Leadership and ICADV consultant. Jody is pictured in the middle, wearing a blue shirt with short brown hair and glasses. And she's waving at you all right now. Thank you, Jody. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see Sarah Boyd. Sarah Boyd is a self advocate and resident at the village of Marici. Sarah has middle, like shoulder length blonde hair. She was just smiling at you all as well. Uh, she's smiling in this photo and wearing a purple shirt. Behind the scenes today, we have several folks that have worked really hard to bring this uh, webinar to you today. So we have Sierra Olivia Thomas Williams uh, of Indiana Disability Justice Leadership Team and ICADV. Uh, Sierra just waved and smiled at everyone. Uh, and she's pictured on the left-hand side of your screen with long brown hair pulled back in a ponytail, wearing earrings, smiling, and a blue tank top. In the photo below on the lower left-hand side of the screen, you'll see Jennifer Milharsik. Jen is a, a consultant at ICADV as well as a member of our Indiana Disability Justice Leadership team. She has middle kind of shoulder length long hair, wearing a plaid shirt and snuggling her pup on the couch in that photo. In the middle with purple hair is me. I'm Haley Rigger. I serve on the Indiana Disability Justice Task Force, as well as um, at ICASA HD, Indiana Coalition of Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see Nicole Cass Colvin of Safe Place. Nicole is a sexual assault and domestic violence advocate. Uh, Nicole could not be here today, but we have a message from Nicole that we will share here briefly, as well as some resources that she really highly recommends folks who are interested in these topics take a look at. And last but not least, we have Sister Jackie McCracken of the village of Marici. Uh, Sister Jackie will be supporting Sarah in today's webinar. All right, so since Nicole, as I mentioned, couldn't be here today, she has tons of resources that she has provided for us um, on primary prevention and uh, sexual violence. Um, so we will be throwing this link into the chat that you can access all of these cool resources that you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen through that one link. We will also send that out to folks after the webinar has completed. All right, so now we'll go to our brief message from Nicole to get us started on today's webinar. Hello, my name is Nicole Cass Colvin. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I've done advocacy work for five years. I've done three of those years in the state of Indiana, and I've gotten the opportunity to collaborate a lot with um, folks from Indiana Disability Justice to serve survivors with disabilities. I've um, been able to walk with 
quite a few survivors with disabilities on their healing process. Um, and I was able to be a panelist on the first webinar in this series. And so um, unfortunately, I'm not able to be here live with you today, but um, Sierra and Jen asked me to um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges within serving survivors with disabilities. So I wanted to touch on a few of the main things that I've seen um, in my advocacy career. And um, so I think some of the challenges are threefold. So um, systemic, societal, and within our agencies. So um, as far as society, of course, we know that violence thrives with oppression. And we know that um, survivors of disabilities and people with disabilities are um, oppressed and um, victimized at really high rates. Um, so we know that just kind of the way things are, um, folks with disabilities may be the most at risk for sexual violence. Additionally, we know that our systems are not set up in a way that's in accessible, inclusive, or supportive for survivors with disabilities um, a, a lot of times. So um, when I say that, a lot of what I think of is that our legal systems, our criminal justice systems, our support systems, um, first of all, they're really focused on like this fast pace. Like, you do a quick interview, you get in and out, your court case is quick, you know. Um, a lot of folks just want to get in and out of the courtroom. Um, there's not a lot of time to think or speak, um, which isn't accessible to everybody. Um, additionally, it's expected that people are able to speak vocally and to tell about their experience, and not everybody does communicate vocally. Um, and so that can be a huge barrier. Um, we also know that um, a lot of the processes really rely on linear narratives. And not everybody thinks linearly, not everybody speaks linearly. And um, I've noticed, especially with survivors with disabilities, um, there may not be a linear narrative. And I, like in my work with survivors, I am normally able to glean, you know, what that person is talking about, what they've been through. But um, a lot of times um, within the system, there's not that attention to um, accepting that narrative if it's not linear. So, um, you know, to the point that a survivor may be accused of false reporting or that um, their case doesn't go anywhere. And so we know that um, if folks aren't held accountable for the harm that they're doing, if survivors aren't supported, that, um, you know, that person who's harming continues to do harm and that survivor um, doesn't necessarily have the same access to health and safety and healing. Um, so also within that, we know that folks with disabilities in general are taught to rely on caregivers, um, to comply with authorities, um, to be touched um, with or without consent, um, and that there's not a lot of comprehensive sexual education. So um, just some things to think about um, as we think about the struggles for survivors with disabilities and the challenges um, that they may face. Um, last, as we think kind of about our agency levels, I think that there's more opportunity for us to continue to be accessible and inclusive, and I say continue, but maybe start to be accessible and inclusive and think about the ways that we can really um, create change in these systems through, you know, partnering with our community partners, collaborating, um, educating, um, also thinking about our own services. Are they accessible? Um, are we um, thinking about accessibility with our buildings, with our materials, 
Um, do we have resources available right offhand if someone needs ASL? Or are we, um, you know, waiting until that's a need? Um, hello, my name is Nicole. All right, thank you so much, Sierra. And thank you to Nicole again, who couldn't be here today with us, but I, I really appreciate the words that she shared there. And it really got me thinking a lot about differences, inclusion, and accessibility. So we're gonna transition into our panel discussion now. And our first question I think is really related to all of what Nicole was just speaking to. So Jody, I see you're um, unmuted already. You're really quick, so I'm gonna ask you first. Equity means that every person has the tools and information needed to succeed. What does having the tools and important, and I'm sorry, what does having the tools and information needed for sexual health mean to you? And why is this important? Um, hey, I'm on, um, I have a peek impairment. Hi, everyone. I have a speech impairment. <laughs> Haley will be helping me communicate. So Haley will be helping me communicate. Tell you, Haley will help putting me in that way. Thank you, Haley, for supporting me in that way. And you're welcome, Jody. When, when, when I have to a witness that are accessible to me, it, it showed me that I am important and a manual. When I have services that are accessible to me, it tells me that I am important and that I matter. To admin, when we can really take more than our Too often when somebody, I'm sorry, what was the next part? Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, boy. Um, when we communicate more than with our words. When we communicate more than with our words? No, no. And I'm talking all over. All over? Yes. Okay. Yes, now. Okay. Starting okay. over. We communicate more than with our words. We communicate more than with our words. So when we have tools and tools that deal with, with the ability and the access. One more time, Jody. I think my sound's a little messed up, so I'm going to switch to my headphones. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry, try again. Um. When we do not have so much as an attendable. When we do not have services that we are accessible. We are so much terrible that the needs don't matter. We are telling people that their needs don't matter. And they are just doing this. And they are and they are, and they are too much trouble to make the effort. And they are too much trouble to make the effort. When we teach, when we, when we teach people this, when we teach people this, we are putting them in home, um, um, we are putting people in harm's way. We are putting people in harm's way. Yes. So that is why, that is why it's important. So that is why it's important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, Luna or Jack, I'm sorry, not Jackie. I saw the name Jackie and <laughs> I'm looking at Sarah, but saw the name Jackie. Luna or Sarah, would you like to speak to that about what having the tools and information needed for sexual health mean to you? Sure. Um, I mean, a lot of what you um, just covered is a, a lot of what I've been noticing and, and feeling myself. 
um, not to just like in terms of sexual pr violence prevention and things like that, but just on a on a day to day basis. Um, so I almost teared up listening to her speak because that's something that's really been heavy on my heart lately. Um, but yeah, she's exactly right. Um, we live in a communities and on society at large that treats disabled people like kind of like we should be not seen or heard. Like everybody knows that we exist, but nobody wants to acknowledge it. And as a result, needs go unmet. We have to rely on people that are unsafe, that are not um, socially, mentally, or emotionally equipped to be able to safely handle our needs. We have to beg for the most basic things to be met and it makes you feel subhuman. And there are a lot of nights, um, especially since I've been focusing more on advocacy, there were a lot of nights I cry because it hurts so bad. And I went through one thing as a child, but as a disabled adult, it's so much more painful because I not only have to go through it for myself, but I have to witness it for other people. And it's just painful to go through your life being constantly given the message in one way or another that we see that you exist, but we don't care. And we're gonna do the bare minimum because we have to. And if that's not good enough, then you need to go away. And it just, it hurts. And, it, and it's not just in um, fields like um, sexual prevention and things like that, it's everywhere. And so when it comes to trying to protect people with disabilities from caregiver violence, sexual violence, things like that, domestic violence, it is so lacking. It is heartbreaking. Having gone through those experiences myself and having um, to fight so hard just to get somebody to hear me, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And like, I'm, I'm traumatized by it. And I not only have to work through the trauma of the abuse that I went through, but I have to work through the trauma of how I was treated when I was trying to get help and how I continue to be treated. Just trying to get daily help that has nothing to do with what I went through. Thank you, Luna. So what I'm hearing from you all is that it's not just violence and abuse from perpetrators, but that is then compounded by how societies and communities treat you. So having these tools and having the information you need for sexual health, from what I'm hearing, makes folks with disabilities feel seen, supported, and valued by their community. That sounds like violence prevention to me, especially to your point, Luna, about um, having to rely on folks that uh, might be unsafe or folks that aren't gonna meet your full needs. So I appreciate you all sharing that. Sarah, do you have anything you want to add on this point? Um, I'm just, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it is hard to where well, people don't listen to you, but it's easy to where well, people do listen to you. It makes it more, that more easier. So and people will help you. So It's easier for you to access resources when folks listen to your needs. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. All right, we'll move on to our next question. Looks like Jody's unmuting. I'm gonna give her just a second. All right, so in our next question, have any of you experienced obstacles in reporting sexual violence or abuse? Did you choose to report this? What influenced your decision? How are you supported? Jody, we can start with you. Um, when, I was in my 20s, when I was in my 20s, I was date raped. Um, 
and the that with poet the ton um with and feel um maybe put in another home. I did not report it because I was in fear of what was that last part? A maybe put in a nursing home. Of being put in a nursing home. Yeah. You see people with this ability I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You mess up in any way. You see, people with disabilities are not allowed to mess up in any way. No. You always explain people will change and put myself in the position. So I was afraid people would say, I put myself in that position. Which, by the way, is bullcrap. Which, by the way, is bullcrap. Um, it is no more um, on the survival. It is never on the survivor. To, to, um, to take on yourself um, the permit. To take ownership of the perpetration. Yes. Um, um, I said no. One more time, I'm sorry. I said no. I said I, no. No, that should have been enough. That should have been enough. It was not. And it was not. Um, People, people with this, people want to protect people with disabilities. People want to protect people with disabilities. And you and you and you hurt us in nursing homes. And they do that, when they do that, they put us in nursing homes. Yeah, they are not protecting us, people. That is not protecting us, people. No, that is taking away our freedom. That is taking away our freedom. It is limiting us for other people behavior. That is blaming us for other people's behavior. This is a little bit of the subject. This is a little bit off the topic. But many homes are more paid for any people for the new love. But nursing homes are no place for anyone to live. For anyone to live. The treatment is horrible. The treatment is horrible. And when you try to when people try to protect us for our own good, when people try to protect us for our own good, they are putting us, oh, putting us in situations for more harm. They are putting us in situations for more harm. Yes. You um, yeah, no, um, I. And do we do that that that, that with oh, my um date rape? I do regret that I did not report my date rape. But, um, I have written to be that that individual can handle in your home. Because I believe this person has continued to do harm. Yeah. But um but at the time, I did the best I could. But at the time, I did the best I could. And that was to um, play with and I, I, I didn't know how to protect my 
Fanum. I didn't want to report. I had no freedom. I had to protect my freedom. Um, and um, I don't want to um, and tell me if you believe and um, I'm going to tell of a deal. And, um, yeah. And I want to add something. If you don't want to make a big deal out of it, if you believe, if you believe that I was making too big of a deal of that, that I was making too big of a deal of that, I'm not. I was not. Three years later. Three years later. Yes, I had um another situation. I had another situation. And then we police. And it was reported to the police. No, I was reporting it. I was reported. No, I was reporting it. I was put it. I was put in. No, I was put in it. I think she. I re reported it. Yeah. Okay. And um. And when and then the police threatened him with a bimini to them on. And then the police trust him. Trusted him. Threatened. Threatened to you is as he and on an easy. Threatened? No, to you, E S T. Questioned. My ability to live alone. The police questioned my ability to live alone. That um, that tone that my sweet little adult with with. Feel what to it. That shows three years ago. My fear was <laughs> correct. Yeah. You um, you um, the feel of union of freedom is a bit written with people with the um, the when not with home. home. So fear of losing their freedom is a big reason people with disabilities don't report harm. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Jody, for sharing that experience. Mm -hmm. You want to raise your hand, maybe? Oh, sure. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, you can go next. Um, um, I I did not re report my um my thing. Um, but I was um, raped, and um, but I did report it. Somebody else did, but I did tell people around me what what happened and what it was. So, and I was told the police came and and all that stuff. So, um, so yes. And how did your parents react? And um, well, the police came and they talked to me, and my my parents react about like. They'll probably be mad at me, maybe, or um, something that right, like mad. At, like, mm -hmm. Is that right? Like mad at me or? Well, they were just angry about the whole thing. Yeah, angry about the yeah, the angry whole about situation about what happened and all that stuff. And they made you move back. Yeah, um, they, and then I went back to my mom's house for a little bit. So, so um, yeah, because I had back up my stuff and moved to mom's house, and then I was. Um, able to to move back into my apartment. So and you, you got help through? I got help through, um, I saw a therapist um, and I taught, um, I saw a therapist, talked to her, and then I was, because afterwards I was having problems of not sleeping and problems at work and stuff with it. So, um, so yeah. So Sarah, you were living independently and you went and stayed with your mom for a little bit. 
but then you're able to go back to your own space again? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good to hear. Yeah. yeah. So, but you did not get really the support you wanted, needed. Do you think? Um, I I think I I think I did. You did get um, support. Yeah. Yeah, I got support because I had a job coach that I pretty much saw every day, pretty much, and she was, um, she heard about it because she was there, and um, and I saw her and talked to her stuff about it and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah. So you had support from your family, from a therapist, and from a job coach. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. So, yeah. How important was that support for you? Um, it was, it was good. It was um, what he did. So, so yeah. So, um, it was very relieving. Um, what, about, what about the village? Um, the village was, they wasn't really um, supportive for me. One hundred percent. There was kind of, um, what do you say, well, mad or disappointed. Something. Well, <laughs> yeah, it was a difficult, it was just a difficult situation. It was a strange situation. I don't know if everybody can hear me, but um, right, Sarah was living at the village and this happened at the village, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so it made for a very um, conflicted um, uh, event for us. But there were people here at the village who guided you, Sarah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To support you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you definitely had some struggles, but you were able to find a good support team. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. You're welcome. Luna, do you have anything to add on this? Uh, yeah, um, my experience getting help for my most recent um, assault, which resulted in, which I don't know, should I issue a trigger warning? Um, sure. Yeah, because I might talk about some stuff that is triggering because my most recent assault is what resulted in the birth of my first son. And my experience is more aligned with Jody's. Um, I didn't have a lot of help. I didn't have a way to go get help or, and I didn't experience any compassion. Like um, Sarah seems to ha have had a much more positive experience and I'm really thankful for that for her. But um, so uh, let me just skim over the question. So um, I, I encountered a lot of obstacles from the moment it happened to, you know, like months after my son's birth. And it's, it's ongoing, to be honest, um, because there's a child involved. Um, so when the assault first happened, um, I had decided, I didn't know I was pregnant. So I had decided I wasn't going to tell anybody. I was just going to move on. And what influenced that decision was, when I was 19 years old, I was with a guy for three years. And then one night he convinced me to drink with him and his cousins. They drugged me, they gang raped me. And um, I tried to get help for that and nobody would help me. Um, we used to have a place uh, where I'm from in, in Madison, Indiana called Turning Point. And I went there um, after talking to another girl that he had tried to assault and um, his friends coming forward and showing support for me. I went there after trying to file charges several times. I finally went there. They said I could speak to an officer. The officer didn't show up, but there was an advocate there that they that said I could speak to her. At the end of it all, she said that if I tried to take it to court, a jury would find me at fault because I chose to drink and 
although I don't remember much about the assault and I definitely don't remember consenting to having an audience or anyone else participating, I said that I did remember consenting to uh, sexual relations with my boyfriend at the time, but that's not what ended up happening. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I was drugged because I knew how much alcohol I could handle. And given what I knew I drank, there's, there's no reason for me to have complete memory lapses, blackouts of the event, things like that. And uh, she basically told me it was my fault. And I had already been told that by, I had to go to, to a mental health inpatient facility because I had had a mental breakdown after it happened. And the nurse there during a group therapy told me that it was my fault. And um, just after going through all that and my parents not being very understanding, my friends not being very understanding and constantly hearing, how can your boyfriend rape you? How is it rape if you were dating him? So when, um, when the most recent assault happened, and I didn't know I was pregnant, I decided I wasn't gonna tell anybody because I didn't wanna go through that again. And my experience with law enforcement previously, I didn't even wanna go through that again. And I was like, I'm never letting him around me. I'm not gonna tell anyone. He'll never be around me again. And then I found out I was pregnant a couple of weeks later. So then it was like, you know, what do I do now? And I was still afraid to tell people, but I was reaching out in some ways, letting people know that I was being abused and nobody did anything. And I even would get anonymous messages from people on Facebook saying, well, if he's so abusive, why are you, st why are you still with him? Why are you letting him come around? And nobody could understand, even though I would say it, I'm disabled and I need help because being pregnant is having an additional disability on top of having cerebral palsy. And I, tr I went the first six months of my pregnancy trying to do it on my own, but I got to a point where I needed so much help on a daily basis and I didn't have anyone to do it. The only one willing to do it was my abuser. So I let him come back around to help me. And after my son was born, I still wanted to tell someone. And I remember laying in the hospital debating on whether or not I should go get the nurse and tell her when he wasn't around me. But I was just the whole time I was afraid if I told someone he would get in trouble, I would get in trouble or like I wouldn't have help anymore. And I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I felt like I had to protect my abuser because in protecting my abuser, I was protecting myself and my survival and my son's survival. I even explored things like adoption, but because of Indiana's laws, if he'd wanted to, he could have stopped it and I would have lost my son forever and I wouldn't have been able to protect him. And because how the law sees it is if I'm willing to give him up for adoption, if the father wants them, they get custody. So I felt like I was forced to give, to give birth and keep my son, even though it was gonna make my life harder, just to protect him from a rapist. And, um, I tried to continue to get away from him even after the baby was born, but again, I couldn't find resources I needed. The resources I had found didn't wanna help me because they were primarily geared towards elderly uh, people. And I had experienced not only ableism, but ageism. Um, the woman that I had spoke to uh, I forget the name of the agency, but she, she showed up at my house unannounced. My son's father was there because I needed help and I didn't have anybody else. She showed up unannounced and we weren't married or anything. So he shouldn't have been able to have any input whatsoever, but she let him have input despite the fact that I explained to her that we weren't together, that I was trying to get away from him and trying to be more independent. She let him have so much input that she told the family support specialist that I had at the time that they were denying me services because I had someone in my life willing to do those things for me and it didn't seem like I needed them. So she literally said, oh, we're not gonna help her because the person abusing her is helping her. Like, and it was just so hurtful. And I remember getting in trouble with my family support specialist and even she was like, why was he at your house? 
why don't you just cut him off? And I told her, I said, I can't cut him off until I get viable resources. Those have to be in place first because he's all I have. And even after my son was born and I had gotten another place of my own, he had tried to assault me again. And I had tried to report those charges and they never went anywhere. Um, there was even a recording that I had managed to get of him admitting to it and the police never did anything. And there's supposed to be protections in place in Indiana so that survivors can't drop charges for things like that. But four months later, um, he threatened me and drove me down to the police station. I went in, told them I needed to drop the charges. She asked why, and I told her, I said, I'm, I'm disabled with a kid. Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do if he gets arrested. I don't know what's gonna happen to me. And I was trying to drop hints as much as possible that I was being coerced into it. And they, let, they, dro they dropped the charges, no questions asked. And I regret, have regretted that ever since. And it just, my experience where I'm from, it just seemed like Nobody really cared at the end of the day. Nobody really wanted to deal with it at the end of the day. So everybody just took the easy way out. And I finally did get people listening to me, but it was staff from Wellstone, which um, I was forced to go to under false claims. Um, and that whole situation was really traumatic, but they believed me about the abuse because they saw the evidence. And they even tried to get adult protection services involved, but adult protection services never did anything. And when I called them a couple months later to follow up, because they had told me at the hospital that adult protection services could press charges for the violence, I called them to follow up and they said, oh no, we don't do that. And I said, well, what do you do? And they're like, oh, we provide pamphlets and resources so that people can find services to get out of their situation and you're already out. So we don't need to help you. And um, so that was really upsetting. Really at the end of the day, the person that provided the most help to me and fought for me the hardest was a social worker from Child Protective Services. And she was, she initially got called in to make sure my son was okay, saw my son was okay, saw that I was the victim. And if it wasn't for her, I don't think that I would have been able to get to the place where I was able to get a temporary protective order. I was able to go to court and testify and do all those things that have led me to where I am now, where although my abuser has parenting time with my son, the Indiana court system has decided it's not appropriate for him to have any legal rights or anything outside of that, which isn't a typical agreement, even in my situation. But getting, even getting the court system to realize the gravity of what I'd went through was extremely difficult. They don't have the education or the resources to even realize how big of a problem this really is. Mm. So yeah. I, I encountered a lot of really traumatic obstacles. Thank you for sharing that, Luna. What I'm hearing from this conversation so often we already know because of the culture that we live in, survivors feel, and if we're honest, survivors already know that they will likely be disbelieved or blamed for the harm that they experience. But compounding on this, survivors with disabilities also have to worry that their independence will be taken from them, that they will lose autonomy, that they will lose the ability to make decisions for themselves. Uh, or that they will lose access to services and not, not be provided the things they need. So I, I appreciate the three of you sharing your stories. I think Luna and Jody, uh, both of your stories really highlight that need for increased accessibility of services and increased um, education for the community around the, the importance of folks with disabilities having that independence and autonomy for themselves and determining what what's right for them. And then I think too, Sarah's experience also kind of highlights that. Sarah was 
uh, in a situation where she was believed, she was supported, and because she had a team of folks who were supporting her and access to resources, she was able to maintain independence in her, in her home. So, and yes, I see in the chat here, somebody says our motto is start by believing. Yes, I love that motto. Thank you for sharing, Jamie. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next question. Um, I am gonna go a little bit out of order. I know you all have access to the questions, but there are a couple that I really wanna make sure we get to today before we, we close out. So I'd like to ask you all, how can different organizations uh, work together, best collaborate to work toward increasing sexual wellness, not just preventing violence, but increasing wellness? Looks like Jody's unmuting. Um, I think it's important to not be so afraid to realize that people with disabilities are telling you beings. I think it's important to remind us that people with disabilities are sexual beings. Yeah, and that means that we need to take access to um information. So that means we need safe access to information. The same. The same access. Yes. As everyone else. Yes. And we need access to birth control. And we need access to birth control. And we need um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And help with people with the family who want to get married and who want to have a family. And people with disabilities who want to get married and want to have a family. Yeah, um, people with disabilities they make to make great power. One more time, I'm sorry. People with disabilities they make great power. People with disabilities can make great parents. And too often, when people with disability um have have children, we are judged. And too often, when people with disabilities have children, we are judged. Z u d z e d. Do you? She said judged. judged. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And people are not happy for us. And people are not happy for us. By the way, I am not a parent. By the way, I am not a parent. And that's how many, and that's how friends who are parents. I just have friends who are parents. I see what they do to me. One more time, ask me. I see what they do to me. I've seen what they go through. And then people, I, people will come up to them and tell them, what are you doing with a kid? And people will come up to them and say, what are you doing with a kid? What in the world, in the world do people have the idea that they can give feedback to people with this ability any time and any place? Why do people have the idea that they can say anything to people with disabilities in any place? Yeah, at any time. At any time. And another example that, that 
Oh, uh, how many am not with Pat then? And another example where our community is not respected. And another example. It is another example. Um, yeah. And I will be honest. Um, and I'm in my forties. And I will be honest. I am in my forties. Yes. And um, how how much with this identity? I'm more common today. Parents with disabilities are more common today. Yes. When I was in my twenties and thirties. When I was in my twenties and thirties. And when I was um the ten and um and um how children or not. And I was deciding whether I was going to have children or not. More than the bed women and the not were behind. One of the big reasons I did not was because I they were in bed with Edward and them. One more time, I'm sorry. And dealt in that with Edward and them. I've dealt enough with ableism. Yeah, and then now I want to deal with the and the ableism. And I did not want to deal with it. With the added. With the added. Ableism. 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 The old have time with me be a parent. That would have come with being a parent. Yeah. So my husband and I made a choice. So my husband and I made a choice. Yeah, you have choice. Not to have children. So the and you other reasons. For that, and there are other reasons. But that was definitely um a big factor. But that was definitely a big factor. Yeah. Wow, thank you for sharing that, Jody. Yes. Luna? Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this question, um, but um, I'd just like to kind of piggyback off of what Jody said, but from a perspective of someone with a disability who is a parent. Um, she she's definitely right about a lot of things like I it was not my choice to become a parent when I did obviously but I've experienced a lot of just inappropriate comments and behaviors from people because I'm yeah. an obviously disabled parent and um, it, even my own family like this is I'm pregnant now and this is my second pregnancy and this one is consensual but Congratulations. Um, hey. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting happier about it now, but it's been hard to enjoy my pregnancy because of the way that I've been treated by other people and the things that have been said by, honestly, a lot of it has come from my own family. Um, I've uh, been encouraged to get an abortion, told I should have got an abortion, told I had no business having another baby. Mm -hmm. We went through we experienced, you know, COVID related major financial issues right before I found out I was pregnant, which anybody can go through disabled or not, but I feel like yeah. I've gotten a lot harsher feedback because I am disabled. And yeah. I haven't even shared a lot of this pregnancy on Facebook because when I do, people come back with very ableist comments like, please, yeah. please tell me this is your last baby. Don't have any more babies. Um, and even my own dad, almost every time I talk to him here the last few weeks, he's stopped because I think he's realized he's making me mad. But, but there for a while, almost every time I talk to him, he's trying to push me to get sterilized. And, you know, I've, I've thought about doing it for myself, but it's one of those things. If I get sterilized, that needs to be solely my decision. And now that people are voicing their opinion about it, I 
I don't want to get sterilized and then wonder, did it, was that really my choice or was I forced to do it? Because I'm genuinely afraid if I get pregnant again, I'm going to be disowned. And because I'm physically disabled, toxic or not, I need my family's help because after my first pregnancy, and I think a lot of this is because it wasn't planned, there was no medical supervision before, and there wasn't a lot after, but my, my disability took on a whole new form after having my first child. So I have issues I didn't have before, and I need more help in ways that I didn't need before. And it's been really difficult to get my family to understand that with age and everything I've been through, my disability has changed. And it's just like, um, and it's like when it comes to being a sexual person, a sexual being, sexual wellness, the most ableism that I've experienced, I've experienced it from everyone, but the most prominent has been from my own family. Um, I remember, you know, when I had my first serious boyfriend, my, my sister, uh, when she lost her virginity at 15, it was no big deal, but I was 17 years old and I was threatened by my mother if she caught me having sex. And uh, when I was 18 and me and my boyfriend were talking about moving in together, um, my mom wanted to put me on lockdown so that basically I couldn't live a normal life. And it's just, um, it, we really need to not only change this mentality from society, but I think it really starts with families because that's where I've experienced the harshest language and, and the most horrible behavior that's pushed me into like isolation at times. And a lot of times the treatment from my family, whether it be topics like this or something else, pushes me into the arms of another person that is likely to be an abusive person. I mean, even my own husband, he's a great guy, but I don't think he fully knew what he was getting into when I told him, you know, you'll be my husband, but you'll have to be my caregiver too. And sometimes it is too much for him. And there has been instances where I have felt neglected and abused by even him, whether he meant to or not, hmm. because I, I don't have a way to outsource help, especially not during COVID. I can't just invite somebody into my house hmm. and my family just, a lot of times they act like it's a pain in their butt. And um, so I think when it comes to uh, promoting sexual wellness and prevention of violence, things like that, it really starts within our own families. Like our, our family members need to be able and willing to participate in some of these services, these discussions, because I mean, if you don't have a good foundation there and you're being abused in that environment, you're gonna go out and continue to be abused by others who don't have as much of an investment in you as your family's supposed to. Mm. So I think that's where it really starts is involving family members in these discussions and encouraging them to participate and understand their, uh, their family members needs better and their, their autonomy and their just their humanity. Because I think a lot of able-bodied people forget that we are humans with the same desires, wants, and needs as everybody else. So but, I'm hearing you say that organizations can best collaborate by engaging family members uh, to talk about a sexual wellness for folks with disabilities. Okay, thank you for sharing. Sarah, did you wanna add anything to that point? Um, I think it's good for people with disabilities to to um, use protection and to use um, other stuff so they won't get like like um, like what was it called? The jerky prevention. Yeah, prevention. Yeah, of, prevention of of sex um, diseases. So of, I mean of diseases. Um, so. 
so that so it will like so we tell you doctor or whatever. So um it, uh, if you don't want any to have any kids or so we to use or protect ourselves so we won't have any babies. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I'm hearing the three of you say that it's really important for folks with disabilities to have a safe space and safe people that they can go to to ask questions, explore their options for contraception, for family planning, for um, prevention and protection of disease, and really to get information about their sexuality and sexual health. All right, thank you all for sharing your insights. So we are gonna to move to our last question. I can't believe we're already at two o'clock in the afternoon. This hour has flown by, uh, but our last question, we wanna leave the audience with something that they can take with them. So could the three of you suggest an action our audience can take uh, today, this week, or this month that can move us toward a vision of sexual wellness uh, for people with disabilities? This is a question I think I was most eager to answer. Um, um, but uh, so throughout my own personal experience, I've, I've noticed a lot of things with, with structures like law enforcement and definitely the legal system. And I don't know if this can be accomplished this week or this month, but we can definitely st start getting something in the works. But I, I desperately believe that our, our legal system, our court system, they need resources and education on how domestic violence and, and abuse and things like that really affect the disabled community. And they don't have it. So I think it would be wonderful if these organizations like, um, like you guys and, and the people watching here today these organizations that are trying to get this message out would organize like a, a seminar or something um, at, at the police stations in the courthouse so that we can discuss these issues, share these statistics so that they can have a better understanding that when a disabled person does come into the courtroom to testify about their abuse, they understand that there is such a greater gravity to that abuse on a disabled person than there is an able-bodied person. Because, I mean, it's a serious situation either way, but there's so, there's so much more, there are so many more layers when it involves a disabled person. And I don't think from my own experience, and I do feel like the court did what they could to protect me in the end, but from my own experience, they really just don't understand that they treat it like everybody else's situation and it isn't and I think there's this mentality both within the disabled community and outside that we should downplay our needs and downplay our differences for the comfort of others yeah and I used to believe this I used to believe that this was appropriate in order to be accepted but as I've gotten older and realized the damage that that has done it's not appropriate. We, sh we should be able to have our differences acknowledged and our different needs acknowledged and the way things affect us acknowledged fully without being seen as poor, pitiful, or pathetic. And we should be able to be accepted and have those things acknowledged. And I think tackling um, law enforcement agencies and the court system and educating them first and foremost is a huge step towards preventing sexual violence and domestic violence in the disabled community and, and better understanding how to protect them when it does happen because I mean, you can't prevent it 100%, it's going to happen. And we need appropriate protections when it does. And they're just not there right now. They might be there in some places, but overall, overarching, they're not there. I mean, you can look at the statistics and see that. Um, Cause I know when I went through what I, when I went through what I went through, my protective order didn't take into account my disability at all. And when my abuser would violate it in some way, it wasn't taken seriously. And the first lawyer I had, she even told me to go out and get a gun 
to protect myself because law enforcement couldn't really enforce it. And I'm like, well, I can't fire a gun. I don't have the physical ability to do that. Uh, how am I supposed to protect myself? I thought they were supposed to protect me and they didn't, they never did. And it just, even with that order in place, I was constantly looking over my shoulder. I constantly felt unsafe. I didn't even want to leave my house. And um, uh, the law enforcement and the courts really need to realize that it's not a one size fits all situation and that there are nuances here that need to be acknowledged. And I think organizing uh, a, a seminar of some sort and maybe something on a regular basis, some sort of training where they can get a better understanding of these things and how we're affected by it would be so beneficial as a, as a big first step here. I've, I've really, really thought about this. Um, and I don't know if anyone else agrees with me, but I think that that's a great place to start. Thank you, Luna. So I'm hearing, so folks who are already in the anti-violence movement can be uh, not just going out and educating law enforcement and the criminal justice system, but also engaging disability service organizations in these conversations so that we can address the unique and specific needs of folks with disabilities who are experiencing violence. Thank you for sharing that. Sarah or Jody, uh, are there any actions that you can suggest our audience take? I think it would be really awesome if um, you take in with someone on if we take in with someone on our own everything. I think it would be really awesome if we take in with someone inventory um, um, our own everything of our own ableism. Will it be primarily? Will it be? At different levels. At different levels. We can do it individually. We can do it individually. We can do it within our organization. We can do it within our organizations. And then, let's be honest, how do we feel about people with disabilities? Let's be honest, how do we feel about people with disabilities? Do we feel like they are a burden? Do we feel like they are a burden? And then, and, and then, and do we feel like they are less than less than other people. And do we feel like they are less than other people? When do we not invest into accessibility? I'm sorry, I heard accessibility. We need... When do we invest? When do we invest? When yes. do we? When do we? Why don't we? invest in accessibility. Yeah. Do we see people with disability as sexual beings? Do we see people at, with disabilities as sexual beings? Do we see people with disability as, as, as having the same rights to the beauty age? Do we see people with disabilities as having the same rights? Should they um, be parents? Should they be parents? And be in relationships or marriages. And in relationships or marriages. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that we just be honest. I think it's really important that we just be honest. Be honest. Until we be honest, we're not going to be able to make the changes that we need. Because until we're honest, we're not going to be able to make the changes, make the changes that we need. 
I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I had a lot of ableism in my life. I've had a lot of ableism in my life. Um, um, you yes, people with disabilities can be ableist too. People with disabilities can be ableist too. I remember growing up. I remember growing up. And they don't want to hang out with people with disabilities. And I did not want to hang out with people with disabilities. And they don't want to be a tenant with them. I didn't want to be in a relationship with them. And they don't want to be continual as one of them people. I didn't want to be one of those people. I want to know, say in with the able-bodied people. I wanted to fit in with the able-bodied people. Because I'm a child from an early age. Because I was taught from an early age. Without words. Without words. The able-bodied people were better than the able that able-bodied people were better than disabled people. Yeah, I believe that. I, I, I can admit that. If I can admit that. And, and um, work through my ableism. And work through my ableism. I know that other people can. I know that other people can. Um, how awesome that would be. And how awesome would that be? And that would see people with the ability as fully human. If we could see people with disabilities as fully human. In every way possible. In every way possible. <laughs> that would be a great day. That would be a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jody, for sharing. Sarah, is there anything you'd like to add before we close out? Yes, I would say um, to learn a lot, learn what you can, um, and don't based on sex on on TV or or the movies, because they try to make it look like fun and and for people, and um, it's fun if you want to do it. But if you don't want to do it, then it's not so fun. Um, and just learn what you can and try to move on from, from it. So. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm hearing educate yourself about people with disabilities. Educate yourself about sexual health and sexuality. Start by believing. I'm going to go back to that. That was in the comment section earlier. Uh, look inward and reflect on your own internalized ableism. And I'm also hearing we can reach out and educate folks in the criminal justice system, folks in healthcare, folks who are serving uh, survivors of violence and folks who are serving folks with disabilities. So thank you all for sharing your insights today. As always, it's so wonderful to learn from you. Um, I did want to share, we've got just a couple of resources that we want to share before we close out. So I apologize. I know we're running a little um, behind schedule right now. I do want to share that on December 16th, we talked a lot about um, parents and parenting today. So I wanted to share on December 16th, we will have a webinar on uh, parenting under depression and all of our panelists are people with disabilities. So please stay tuned and come back and check that out. All right, so we do have a few resources to share with you. We're gonna look at some suggested advocacy resources that Nicole shared with us. Uh, first and foremost, we at IDJ love Mia Mingus and the pod mapping. So uh, please check that out. It's really, really helpful. Um, I've used it for myself as well as uh, used it with friends. Um, pod mapping is a really great tool to figure out who are the people that you trust that you can build deep, real community and relationships with. Um, who can you reach out to when you have experienced harm or when you have caused harm? Who are the uh, resources in your community that you can reach out to? Uh, and it helps you just kind of 
ca categorize the people in your life and the resources near you um, so that you know who you can turn to when you have experienced harm or when you have caused harm against someone else. I also wanna share a book called Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement. This is edited by Ajaris Dixon and Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarina. Uh, they are both disability justice advocates and folks engaged in the anti-violence movement. So these are essays on um, uh, creating safety and community and tools for accountability. And uh, Mia Mingus and her pod mapping is included in that book as well. Sierra has dropped a link to um, the resources on primary prevention that Nicole shared with us. We also wanna highlight this accessible de-escalation uh, strategy. Again, she's just included that in the chat. So things that you can do to de-escalate de yourself, things that you can do to work with uh, a client or survivor who's experiencing uh, maybe a little bit of overwhelm, how you can help them de-escalate. And then lastly, we want to check out um, accessible needs and strengths-based case planning. So helping an individual identify their health and safety needs, um, helping those folks identify safe and supportive people, helping them do that pod mapping, um, resources and collaboration, coping skills, all of those good inventories that folks would need. Uh, to view the whole video that uh, Nicole shared with us, we will share that link in the chat as well. And then lastly, please reach out to us, contact us if you have any questions, please check out our website. We've got a ton of resources. Uh, we've got part one of our webinar series, um, lots of other webinars, uh, resources. We have uh, writing and art pieces by folks with disabilities. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool thing to check out as well. We appreciate you all being here with us today. And of course, we thank you to our panelists and to everybody that made this webinar possible today. Thank you so much, Jen, for doing that behind the scenes, creating our PowerPoint and making sure everything was running smoothly. Jen and Sierra took care of that. Thank you, Jody, Luna, and Sarah, again, for sharing your wisdom and insight. We learned so much from you. And lastly, here's our funding disclaimer. <laughs> Hey, yes, Jody. Do we have a two, two twenty? I thought we had until two fifteen. Okay. Sierra just shook her head. Am I wrong? Uh, um, no, we can go until two thirty if oh. we want. Uh, uh, I thought we had until two fifteen. I'm so sorry. That's why I was kind of running through. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. We can. Um, up for any questions. Yes. yes. Let's open up for questions. It's a great idea, Jody. That was the plan. Yes. Any questions? Or oh, any comments? I'm, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> my name is Pat Carney. I'm from Massachusetts. I am just so impressed with how articulate all of the panelists are in sharing the depth of your stories. And I just think younger people could benefit so much from listening to you. I, I wonder if there is an opportunity for a speakers bureau for you um, to go into schools with young women and mm -hmm. with young men, of course, who mm -hmm. absolutely need to hear this stuff. Is, does that exist where you are? That's actually something that I've been looking into. Um, I'm still looking into it, but it's, it's definitely something I've thought about and would like to do because I know um, in schools themselves, there's not a lot of education on domestic and sexual violence, and there's definitely not a lot of education on disabilities. I'm, I'm almost 30, so it's been a while since I've been in school, but I know when I was in school, a lot of the disabled kids were hidden away or separated from the rest of the group. I went through it, even though I was in uh, regular classes, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something that I've 
thought about um, working with this panel and working with Nicole has definitely inspired me to look into maybe being an independent consultant of some sort for things like this. So it's something I'm still looking into. <laughs> Thank you. I think you, I think it'd be great. I think it'd be great. Me, do you have a question? Yeah, hi, I'm Jamie. I'm with our Sexual Assault Response Unit and um, for the Disabled Persons Protection Commission in Massachusetts. And we have a wonderful team of folks who are navigators and also a peer support leader team um, that is peer survivors that work with other peer survivors uh, working on self-care and other types of things. But one of the things I wanted to mention is that they're all part of a peer support national network. Um, uh -huh. And if you want to, I put my email in the chat, if you want to reach out and connect, I would love to get you all involved in that if you'd like to, because we're definitely looking for more seats. There's only like a handful of people. It's hard to find um, folks with disabilities who are also survivors that are willing to talk about their stories. And you guys do such an amazing job that I think you'd be really a benefit to that board because they do a lot of work, a lot of advocacy, a lot of education. Um, they'll be presenting at the NAPSA conference coming up in a couple of weeks in California. Uh, there's lots of great opportunity there. So if you guys want to reach out, that'd be excellent. I'd, I'd love to see you join that. That will be awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you for your stories they are really powerful. Thank you so much for, for that um, offer. I'm definitely saving your email because I, I would definitely be thrilled to do something like that. Yes. This is one of those things where I've always wanted to do something for the community, but didn't know how until I got involved with this. So I'm just kind of blindly been doing research. So thank you so much. Um, Yes, thank you. Sierra has dropped that in, a, in the chat again, so it's at the bottom for everyone to see. She also shared a link to Self Advocates Indiana speaker, Speakers Bureau, uh, so we encourage any self advocates on the call, including our panelists, to check that out if you have not already before. I have something. Yes, Sarah. I think um, something like this would is good um, for me to get my story out and mm. help other people and to help women and men um, with disabilities. So, yeah. because when I was, was in therapist therapy, I did told my therapist that I do want to help, help people, but I didn't know how to do it. So something like, mm -hmm. something like this is good to do. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here and for sharing your story. And yeah. I hope you check out these other options too, the Speakers Bureau and connecting with Jamie and the Peer Advocacy Network. Okay. It looks like we've got a hand raised. Rachel, do you have a question? Uh, thank you. Um, I really don't have a question, but I, I have a comment. <clears throat> And my comment is just to commend Jody, Luna, and Sarah for their brave and courageous and soulful insight on how they just get along the challenges that they encounter in their daily lives as a woman with disability. I'm speaking from Nigeria, um, one of the most populous black country in mm. the world. And I have a colleague here whom together we prefer programs for underserved women in rural and suburban communities in mm. some parts of Nigeria to equip them um, as women with disability, to equip them with basic um, skills around safety mechan mechanism, defense mechanism, and even just providing them economical su support so that they are, um, you know, build their self as that then they are lifted from any sort of um, um, stigma that resulted out of the sexual gender-based violence. So basically, I can really resonate with your you know, fears because we've actually interviewed most of these women. And when you ask them most of the time, many of them are victims of this because of the fact that a lot of communication resources are, are not met with them. 
and the gaps um, with the um, government and the stakeholders who are supposed to provide or protect them um, is lacking. So that's one of the factors among many that they experience in this part of the world. And I wanted to say that lastly, that we are willing to <clears throat> also have any of you come around uh, virtually and provide some sort of mentorship to just women with disability. They come from different clusters, like women with hard of hearing, women with Down syndrome, autism, um, cerebral palsy, I mean, just name mm. it. So it would be great to have you one of these days just come around to provide them some sort of chair and, and some sort of you know, encouragement so that they will understand that this challenges is, it's not just a local contest, but it's across all boards. It, it can happen in any part of the world. And it's, it's really important for us to see ourselves as a support mechanism whereby when we have challenges like this, we can speak to one another and you know just mm -hmm. remove around, um, put down our geographical differences or you know mm -hmm. um, sexual or religion differences and then work mm -hmm. together to provide a safety mechanism for ourselves. So basically, I just want to say lastly, thank you so much um, for, for, for this. And I'm looking, we're looking forward to engaging with you in the nearest future. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rachel. What an incredible opportunity for our panelists. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions or comments before we close out for the day? I see Sierra is asking, Rachel, may we reach, reach out to you? Do you have an email address or phone number we could reach out to you with? Yes, please. Um, I will share that on the chat box. Um, yes, definitely Thank so do. Much. Thank you so yeah. much. I, I have a question real quick. Yeah. Um, so the emails and things that are being shared, because I'm having to copy and paste them a little slow. So. Um, would somebody who's hosting this be able to send me those links and resources so that I don't lose them in the chat? Yes, I believe Sierra is gonna send out an email to all participants with our- Because I wanna make sure I'm able to have these email addresses because I am in, interested in these opportunities. Absolutely, we'll get that to you. All right, well, thank you all it so looks much. Looks like we have one more question. Is it I possible? I know that we're a little over, but um, we have one more question. Yeah. Yes, Melva, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just like I had written in the chat, but I just thought to retreat on it. This has really been really um, insightful. And um, I've come to see that the challenges that persons with disabilities face, especially women, those challenges transcend across, transcend across borders. It's, yes. it's not just the local context, because yes. working with um, persons with disability in rural communities in Nigeria, they face a lot of these problems and some of the factors that um, sort of bedevil these problems or occasion these challenges on them is the cultural, um, the culture in itself. I, I heard a lot of Luna and she kept talking about some of the challenges also coming from family. And then when these challenges are embedded in the culture, it's, it's a problem, it's double tragedy. And um, listening to all of you speak has really, um, sort of given more insight into some of the global context to these challenges. And like Rachel said, I think it would really, really um, be of mutual benefit to have some of you come virtually from time to time to talk to these ladies. Some of them just think that where they are, that's all, that's, it's their problem. They're the only ones going through these problems. And when we interact with them, they would feel like we do not understand Yes. some of their challenges because we are not disabled when yeah. we tell them how great they are they're like oh you would say that i know you love yeah. me you would say that 
but they need to hear it. They need to know it. They need to understand it and they need yes. to believe it. So yes. thank you women for being so strong and um, for not letting what you have been through to change who you are or mm. change your narrative of yourselves. So mm. it's really, really commending, commend, commendable what you do. Thank you so much for being yourselves. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for sharing. I am so excited and I appreciate Melva that you pointed out that this transcends geographical boundaries. This is an yeah. issue globally, both yes. violence and specifically violence against folks with disabilities and this culture of ableism um, truly is a global issue. So I appreciate you for speaking out and for reaching out to us and for being here today. I'm so excited. We've got folks from across the country as well. Um, I'm really glad that we were all able to be in community together today. Again, thank you to our panelists for sharing their expertise and their wisdom. Have a great day, everyone.